Welcome to Artificial Intelligence for Robotics. You are entering an exciting seven-week class in which you learn how to program self-driving cars. And just to motivate what we're trying to achieve in this class, let me show you some videos. So my interest in self-driving cars started with the DARPA Grand Challenge in 2004, in which my team at Stanford developed Stanley, a robot that could drive itself to the Mojave Desert. The vehicle was based on a Volkswagen Touareg, it was equipped with all kinds of sensors like GPS and laser, and it was able to make its own decisions without any human input whatsoever. The DARPA Grand Challenge was a government-sponsored race that took place in 2005. Here we see our robot Stanley uh, moving through the desert uh, completely without a human on board. The task was to drive a desert trail for about 130 miles, and whoever was fastest would win the race. Here we're passing a different robot by Carnegie Mellon University about 110 miles into the race. Uh, our robot was able to navigate really steep uh, mountainous roads and able to avoid collisions with rocks or falling down a cliff all based on its ability to use what I'm going to teach you in this class. After almost seven hours and 131 miles, our robot returned all the way to the starting base as the first robot to ever finish a DARPA Grand Challenge, winning Stanford University two million bucks and Stanley a place in the Smithsonian Museum of American History. This robot led to the Urban Challenge in which we built a, uh, another robot called Junior that eventually took second place. The Urban Challenge was a follow-up race by DARPA in which cars were asked to drive in traffic. So whereas the Grand Challenge was kind of a motionless desert floor, this was a mock urban city where the robot was able to interact with other traffic and had to follow traffic rules, as in this left turn over here. It had to be able to stay on lanes with very high precision, accommodate oncoming traffic, and just drive confidently in a situation that really resembled a small city. This led at Google to a sequence of experiments known as the Google self-driving car. And I believe these are the best robotic cars out there today. Here we see one of our Priuses on University Avenue in Palo Alto, kind of undetected, driving just like a human driver, but this car is driving by itself. Our cars have been able to drive hundreds of thousands of miles all across California and some of Nevada in downtown areas like San Francisco, on busy highways, uh, in uh, here in Monterey, a small coastal city in California with lots and lots of pedestrians. And these are all completely self-driven moments where the car is able to accommodate things like deers in the headlight in the middle of the night or even crooked Lombard Street in San Francisco, as shown in this video. This is what I'm doing on my day job. I really love uh, with my team building self-driving cars. We believe it's going to be change the world. And in this class, that's what I hope to enable you to do. So let's dive in. The very first problem I'm trying to solve is called localization. And it involves a robot that's lost in space. It could be a car, it could be a mobile robot. So here's his environment. And the poor robot has no clue where it is. Similarly, we might have a car driving on a highway. And this car would like to know where it is. Is it inside the lane or is it crossing lane markers? Now, the traditional way to solve this problem uses satellites. And these satellites mm. emit signals that the car can perceive. That's known as GPS, short for Global Positioning System. And it's what you have in your dashboard if you have a car with GPS that shows you the maps and shows you where you are. Now, unfortunately, the problem with GPS is it's really not very accurate. It's really common for a car to believe to be here, but it has two all the way up to 10 meters of error. So if you try to stay in the lane with 10 meters of error, you're far off and you're driving right over here and you crash. So for our self-driving cars to be able to stay in lanes using localization, we need something like two to 10 centimeters of error. And then we can drive with GPS in lanes. So the question is, how can we know where we are with 10 centimeter accuracy? 
That's the localization question. In the Google self-driving car, localization plays a key role. Uh, we record images of the road surface and then use the techniques I'm just about to teach you to find out exactly where the robot is. And it does so with a few centimeter accuracy and that makes it possible to stay inside the lane even if the lane markers are missing. So localization has a lot of math. But before I dive into mathematical detail, I want to give you an intuition for the basic principles. I want to tell you the story of how a robot localizes, and then we can go through the math together so you can understand it. I also want to let you program your own localizer so you can program a self-driving car. Let me begin my story in a world where a robot resides. And let's assume the robot has no clue where it is. Then we will model this with a function that I'm going to draw into this diagram over here, where the vertical axis is the probability for any location in this world. And the horizontal axis corresponds to all the places in this one-dimensional world. The way I'm going to model the robot's current belief about where it might be, its confusion, is by a uniform function that assigns equal weight to every possible place in this world. That is the state of maximum confusion. Now to localize, the world has to have some distinctive features. So let's assume there's three different landmarks in the world. There's a door over here, there's a door over here, and a third one way back here. And for the sake of the argument, let's assume they all look alike, so they're not distinguishable. But you can distinguish the door from the non-door area, from the wall. Now let's see how the robot can localize itself by assuming it senses, and it senses that it's standing right next to a door. So all it knows now that it's located likely next to a door. How will this affect our belief? Here's the critical step for localization. If you understand this step, you understand localization. The measurement of a door transforms our belief function, defined over possible locations, to a new function that looks pretty much like this. For the three locations adjacent to doors, we now have an increased belief of being there, whereas all the other locations have a decreased belief. This is a probability distribution that assigns higher probability for being next to a door, and it's called the posterior belief, where the word posterior means it's after a measurement has been taken. Now, the key aspects of this belief is that we still don't know where we are. There's three do possible door locations. And in fact, it might be that the sensors were erroneous and we accidentally saw a door where there is none. So there's still a residual probability of uh, being at these places over here. But these three bumps together really express our current best belief of where we are. This representation is absolutely core to probability and to mobile robot localization. Now let's assume the robot moves. Say it moves to the right by a certain distance. Then we can shift the belief according to the motion. And the way this might look like is about like this. So this bump over here made it to here. This guy went over here, and this guy over here. Obviously, this is a robot, it knows, it knows its heading direction, it's moving to the right in this example. But it, and it knows roughly how far it moved. Now, robot motion is somewhat uncertain. We can never be certain where the robot moved. So these things will be a little bit flatter than these guys over here. The process of moving those beliefs to the right side is technically called a convolution. And let's now assume the robot senses again. And for the sake of the argument, let's assume it sees itself right next to a door again. So the measurement is the same as before. Now the most amazing thing happens. We end up multiplying our belief, which is now prior to the second measurement, with a function that looks very much like this one over here, which has a peak at each door. And out comes a belief that looks like the following. There's a couple of minor bumps, but the only really big bump is this one over here. This one corresponds to this guy over here in the prior, and it's the only place in this prior that really corresponds to the measurement of a door, whereas all the other places of doors have a low prior belief. So as a result, this function is really interesting. It's a distribution that focuses most of its weight onto the correct hypothesis of the world being on the second door. And it provides very little uh, belief to places far away from doors. At this point, our robot has localized itself. If you understood this, you understand probability and you understand localization.
So congratulations. You understand probability and localization. You might not know yet, but that's really a core aspect of understanding a whole bunch of things I'm going to no. teach you in the class today. So let's move into our first programming exercise and let's program together the very first version of robot localization. So here's a bit of program code, an empty list. And what I'd like you to program is a world with five different cells or places where each cell has the same probability that the robot might be in that cell. So probabilities add up to one. Here's a simple quiz for the cells x1 all the way to x5. What is the probability of any of those x's? So index i goes from one to five. And the answer is 0 0.2, which is 1, the total probability, divided by 5 grid cells. So in our Python interface, I'd like you to take this code over here, which assigns to p an empty list, and modify it into code where p becomes a uniform distribution over 5 grid cells, as expressed in a vector of 5 probabilities. So here's an easy solution. You just initialize the vector with five zero point twos. Let's see if we mod can modify this um, to make a vector of length n, where I can vary the value of n and get a resulting vector with n elements. So for n equals five, we would get the same result as before. But for n equals 10, I should get a vector of length 10, each of which would have value of 0 0.1. And the answer is simple. You use a for loop, as shown here, and you append to the list Titan. n elements, each of size 1 over n. The dot over here is really important. It gives you the uh, floating point version. Unfortunately, if we leave it out, the result would just be zeros, which is not what you want. So now we're able to initialize the initial belief of the robot in the world over here. And range of n, e, and so let's look at the measurement of this robot in its world with five different grid cells, x1 through x5. Let's assume two of those cells are colored red, whereas the other three are green. As before, we assign uniform probability to each cell of 0 0.2, and our robot is now allowed to sense. And what it sees is a red color. How will this affect my belief over different places? Obviously, the ones for x2 and x3 should go up, and the ones for x1, x4, and x5 should go down. So I'm going to now tell you how to incorporate this measurement into our belief with a very simple rule, a product. Any cell where the color is correct, any of the red cells, will be multiplied with a relatively large number, say 0 0.6. That feels small, but as we'll see later, it's actually a large number. Whereas all the green cells will be multiplied with 0.2. If you look at the ratio of those, then it seems about three times as likely to be in a red cell than it is to be in a green cell, because 0.6 is three times larger than 0.2. Now let's do the multiplication. For each of those five cells, can you tell me what the result would be multiplying in the measurement in the way I've stated? So please, for these five boxes, fill out the number. And the answer is obviously for the red cells, we get a 0.12. Whereas for the green cells, we get a 0 0.04, which is the product of 0 0.2 times 0 0.6 versus 0 0.2 times 0 0.2. And this is, in principle, our next belief. It only has one problem, which is it isn't a valid probability distribution. And the reason why is probability distributions always have to add up to 1. So if I ask you what's the sum of the, all these values, then we find out it doesn't add up to 1. So please type in the sum of all these values. So if you add up all these values, you get 0.36. To turn this back into a probability distribution, we will now divide each of these numbers by 0.36. So differently, we normalize. 
So please, in these five fields, enter your result for dividing 0.04 or 0.12 by 0.36. And please check that the sum of those truly adds up to 1. So 0.12 divided by 0.36 is the same as 12 divided by 36 is the same as a third, or 0 0.333. And 0 0.04 divided by 36 is the same as 4 divided by 36, and that is 1 over 9. And if you look at these numbers, a third plus a third plus 3 ninths is another third, gives exactly 1. So this is a probability distribution, which is often written in the following way. Probability of each cell, i, where i could range from 1 to 5, after we've seen our measurement. Z. The probabilist would also call it posterior distribution of place xi given measurement z. So let's implement all this. xi given measurement z. So let's implement all this. 5 after probability 1. So this is a probability distribution, which is often written in the following way. Probability of each yes, cell, I, I so. where I could range from 1 to 5, after we've seen our measurement, Z. The yes, probabilist would also call it Z. posterior oh. distribution of posterior place XI given measurement Z. So let's implement all this. So here's our initial distribution again. Here's our factor for getting the color right or for getting it wrong. And let's first start with the non-normalized version. Write a piece of code that outputs p after multiplying in p hit and p miss at the corresponding places. To turn this back into a probability distribution, we will now divide each of these numbers by 0.36. So here's our initial distribution again. Here's our factor for getting the color right, or for getting it wrong. And let's first start with the non-normalized version. Write a piece of code that outputs p after...
the Python uh, me to appreciate this. So this is my for loop. Syntax
define a function, this uh, function, and then put all this inside. Tap. Okay, so this function of Python. Inside the form, let's put it inside. So one way to do this is to go explicitly through all these five different cases from zero to four and multiply in manually the miss uh, or hit case. This is not particularly elegant, but does the job. And as I hit the run button, we get the correct answer that's not normalized. So that's not what I want, man. And uh, let's declare a variable no, constant here. I wonder if this is possible. So this would be yes. This is the string convention. Okay. So if the world C has me, 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 me. And the uh, function then I'll okay, like okay. Detection. Okay, so this is called check. Check. So this is the stuff inside P right now. It's, uh, I've been hit. It is the world. So let me just change this a bit. It is the Boolean.
equals string equal. Um, so. So it's a bit confusing. So uh, this head is my boolean, and that head is a string that I want to check whether it's true. So if it's true, if it's really head. Multiply by this, multiply by the probability that the P has initially. Okay, so uh, if it's a uh, hit, 1 minus 1 is 0, 0, multiply by anything is 0. So you don't get it. Okay. Whereas if it's 0, if the boolean is zero, zero multiplied by p hit will give you zero, and one minus zero will give you the p miss. So the p miss will end up multiplying to the p uh, vector. Okay. So the next thing is I probably probably need to. My Q. Probably I'll print the vector Q. Let's test run. So they say Q is not defined. Um, yep. So I will need to. Well, um, do you get? Do you guys get that? Okay, so yeah, that's all for this uh, video, and it's eleven twenty-one already. I better go to sleep. Yep. So see you guys.